When we are building tile sets for level design, we need to think about how all of the pieces fit together to let us construct large, complex scenes quickly and easily. This means that at a basic architectural level, we need to maintain some kind of shape cohesion. This is where a profile comes in. We know that if we want to build sci-fi corridors, then we will need a variety of pieces to be able to construct different junctions. At a bare minimum, a straight piece, a corner, and any filler floor and ceiling parts. When building the primary structural parts, we will always need to know where to place our pivot, otherwise known as the origin of the object. This will be essential for helping us snap pieces together later inside of Unity. As we move things around in Unity, if we have our transform mode set to pivot instead of center, then the gizmo will show us where the origin of the object is. By going to Edit, Snap Settings, we can snap the object to an invisible grid using the provided values. This is almost essential and incredibly useful. Holding control while transforming the object will make it do so in increments, which will be useful for helping us quickly piece scenes together. So the general process here is model pieces, construct prefabs, and then build level. For modeling the pieces, I'll start off with a profile, in this case an octagon, and give it the length that I want a standard straight piece to be. I'll hollow it out by removing the end faces and give the shell some thickness with the solidify modifier. I'll enable even thickness to keep it consistent. Now if I take the object and make a few copies, maybe rotate one of them on the z-axis by 90 degrees, then this is how they will fit together. At the intersection, we can see some gaps, and this is where we will be creating corner pieces to close off the outside world. Now there's a choice to be made here. We could just make one object for a corner gap and duplicate it all around in Unity, or you could fill in all of the gaps and make that one object by itself. What I like to do here is compromise by doing two corners because I'm never in a position where I need just one. You can fill the gap in any way you want. There's a virtually limitless number of ways to connect the pieces, restricted only by your creativity. But for this set, I'll just be connecting them with straight lines. There are a number of ways to do this. You could duplicate the vertices, separate them, and join them into a new mesh, then construct faces between them. Or you could build a new object from scratch, and use the vertex snapping settings to create new parts at the location of the original mesh. I'm going to use the vertex snapping method just to demonstrate it. So now I've got the corner piece, and that's enough to start producing corner junctions in the corridor. We will need a floor and ceiling piece to close the upper and lower parts of the junction though, and we can do this the same way we did the corners. Once that's done, we end up with what is essentially a block out tile set that's come straight out of the PlayStation 1 era. But while we are here, we're just going to take a moment to talk about interior versus exterior walls. In game engines, geometry is usually only rendered on one side, unless explicitly told to render on both. In most games with modular tile sets, the walls are one-sided, unlike what we have here. It's easy to do, just remove the surrounding faces, but whether or not you want the surrounding faces depends on where you want your content to appear. For example, if we know these pieces are only going to be used for interior scenes, then it would be worth making them one-sided for performance reasons. But let's say that I wanted to build a kind of planetary habitat model out of prefabricated pieces, and I want my player to be able to move in and out of the building, then it would be quite viable to keep the outside geometry as well, so it can be seen from the outside. These are common choices that need to be made when building environmental content. I like to keep my pieces double-sided because I never know where I'm going to end up using them. Now what I want to do from here is build a few walkway pieces for my player to walk on. Like I said in the first video, I'm going for a raised platform to give us space to add details below the player. We'll talk more about this with the illusion of depth later on. For the walkway, I'm starting by blocking out a straight segment, an L and an X junction. For now, there will be no detail on them. We're just going to use them for our level block out. Once these are done, I think it's about time to flick over to Unity and start preparing the scene. 
there are some notes that you'll need to remember when it comes to the exporting content. First of all is scale and rotation. If your content is the size you want it to be and have the correct rotation, such as our straight corridor piece, then before we export it, we should press Ctrl plus A and select Apply Scale and Rotation. This is just in case we manipulated the scale or rotation of the object while in object mode during our modeling. It's good practice to do this for all models you export, especially if you don't have a proper understanding of how the target destination will interpret the scale and rotation of the object. You want to make sure that the origin of the object is in an appropriate place to reconstruct the content in engine later on. I like to use the center of the world and the 3D cursor in Blender to help line this up. Pressing Shift plus C in versions of Blender prior to 2.8 will return the 3D cursor back to the center of the world. Pressing Ctrl, Alt, Shift and C will bring up a menu where we can move the origin of the selected object to the cursor. For symmetrical architectural pieces, I tend to place it at the center or at a corner, but for objects that are intended to be angled around other pieces, I tend to put the origin at a pivot point that lines up with the neighboring pieces. When it comes to the export format, I use FBX because it's just easier to work with and it preserves the object origin as the pivot point. Not all formats do this. When exporting to Unity, I have a preset for the settings already prepared. I recommend that you use these settings too. I have selected objects ticked, so it'll only export the individual objects we choose, and applied transforms is also ticked. Now from this point onwards, I'm going to talk less about the individual actions I do, and more about the general changes I'll make to get us to the demonstration scene. There are already enough tutorials out there to teach you about modeling basics with Blender and placing objects with Unity. In Unity, I turn the block out models into prefabs and start laying out the scene. I give the models basic mesh colliders and throw a first person controller in there. I believe that you should always be thinking about the human scale when building environments. Being able to walk around from as early on in the process as possible is a very good idea. I walk around for a while and start to visualize what kind of things I want to walk past and what details I can add to make the place more immersive. And just to remind you, this is our starting block out and this is what our demonstration scene looks like. To start improving the scene, I'll add some repeating elements on the ceiling. Repeating elements are common and provide visual indication for distance when looking down a path. Players may not always stop and analyze detail elements, but walking past protrusions and recessions in the environment really helps to sell a sense of depth, especially in dark and horror-focused scenarios where players will overanalyze the silhouettes they pass, looking for signs of murderous alien life. To give the corridor some clues as to what sorts of functions they might serve, I'll create and add some piping shapes that weave their way around the walls. I'll duplicate the piping to make it a grouping of three pipelines stacked vertically that take up more of the screen. An interesting idea in the final corridor would be to give these different colors and even texture decal indications as to what they are carrying. In reality, pipelines wouldn't be exposed unless there was some kind of industrial or maintenance reason, but we could ignore reality for the sake of making something that looks cool. Making pipes in Blender is quite a breeze using curves. We have a lot of control over the number of segments and loops. The HardOps plugin, which is paid, does a nice job at simplifying this even further by letting us manipulate curve settings in one operation and just scrolling the mouse to change the segment count. This technique is also very useful for creating handles. The floor panels will need some detail, so I create something simple. Both the ceiling and floor now have some structural detail to them, but I will change this very soon. I want to add some segmentation to the corridor segments, so I'll create and place a piece that intrudes into the interior space. This will also make the corridor look more structurally sound. The wall spaces in between the separators are looking kind of empty, so I'll create a simple detail piece that can repeat along the pathway. This is where we can start to talk about the illusion of depth. 
One of my key tips for environment design in general is to always try and trick the player into thinking there is more to see. Make them think there's always something more behind the wall, under the floors, in the ceiling above them and right around the corner. A good example of this would be the use of grating. Having grating along the walls and floors is useful for sci-fi corridors because it's both structural and allows the player to see through it to the details behind. We will incorporate some grating soon, but for now, to fill up these empty wall sections, I'll make a collection of slats that are closed. Slats, like grating, are another cool idea for the illusion of depth, because you could get creative with opening only a few individual slats at a time to reveal details behind. Once I've placed my closed slats, I take a little walk around the scene and think that I could start adding some depth to the ceiling area again. I'll put some grating between the repeating elements of the top. We could hide wires and all kinds of objects up there for the player to look up at. The wireframe modifier in Blender is really useful for creating this. In fact, I'll go one step further and create some hanging wires that actually use the ceiling elements as support. This will help to break up the uniformity. But what I notice now when walking around is that we violated our rule of the symmetry of scaling. Notice how the ceiling details and the floor details now look off proportion. The gaps in the floor segments look way too large and lacking in detail. This is because we never really stopped to think about the cohesion and consistency of detail in our scene, mostly because we were just improvising. But that's not a problem. We'll create some new objects to replace them now. This time, I want to do something a little bit more versatile. Instead of having whole objects for the straight walkway pieces, I'm going to create a smaller, modular and tileable floor grating set that can be turned into all kinds of pathways. Again, I'll make use of the wireframe modifier to do this. By making the detail smaller scale, preferably the same scale as the ceiling grating, then we'll comply with the symmetry of scale and end up with corridor details that are hopefully more appealing and believable. Suffice to say that now we have made the walkway more appealing, the player may glance their eyes down here from time to time. The lower corners of the straight corridor segments are looking quite bare, so what I'm going to do is just fill that in with some placeholder detail object. It's nothing too complex, but it is going to give us a few more interesting angles. One thing that you might notice is that different parts of my objects are coloured in different ways. What I'm actually doing is preparing the hypothetical uses of materials and giving them different shades to indicate what their final result might look like. In my case, lighter shades are being used for primary structure, mid shades are used for secondary details, and dark shades are used for tertiary details. I've also made it so that the darker the shade, the more reflective the details. As a side note, I found that reflective pipes can look very cool because you can represent a lot of lighting information on a curved surface. It's quite easy to prepare materials in Blender. When you have an object selected, add the material slots and assign the appropriate materials. The FBX format will preserve the slots and material IDs in Unity, so objects that share the same materials will automatically adopt them after being imported. You will need to extract the materials from the object in Unity at least once though. At the corner junctions, the upper and lower corners are very bare, but I don't quite know what to do with them. If I had a more solid purpose for the corridor, I would try to weave it into places like this, but for now I'll just remember back to the illusion of depth and put some vent-like details up there. Places like this are a good place to break the radial symmetry, not every corner has to be the same. These corners would actually be excellent places to put some screen-like markers donating the sector of the corridor in a spaceship or station for example. Speaking of signage, I want to add at least a small amount of text. When done appropriately, it really makes a lot of difference. However, text can also ruin a scene because our proclivity for reading means that our eyes are immediately drawn to it. My advice for text in a detailed 3D scene is to start small. I'm going to make a little sign and attach it to the end of the ceiling details so that it can be read from the junction. Keep in mind that every detail we make can be improved upon. Environment design is an iterative process especially when improvisation is involved. We can step up the detail layer by layer, and as we gain new perspective on the scene, we can remove sections and replace them with completely different objects. Something I should also mention is the power of recycling. Productive developers recycle work and construct frameworks that are continuously improved and built upon rather than starting from scratch every time they start a new project. This applies heavily to programmers but sometimes artists neglect this fact as well. Keep everything you make stored away in a digital vault. I keep a hotswap SSD that contains my asset vault which is occasionally banked up in the cloud. Once you've created a template tileset for one profile you'll never have to make it ever again and you can use it as a starting point for new works too. This applies to most digital creative fields. 
we can do what other physical fields cannot, which is duplicate our work as many times as we like. In the digital space, our virtual worlds are not confined by the laws of physics, although our processing of the information that describes those worlds may be. Now for more details, I'm going to add some canister-like objects that sit on the base of the corridor and protrude to just above the walkway height. And I'm also going to add some sidebars that repeat at the same distance as the segment separators. These are things that people could hold onto as they traverse their way down the walkway. But now there's something really significant missing from this environment. Lighting sources. When designing for humans, lighting usually comes from above. Our eyes are always skimming the floor and having light beaming directly into our eyes from below will tamper with our vision. That is unless the lighting from below is ambient and more backlit. Having a creative use of lower lighting coming from under the walkway would be really cool, especially if there were some consideration for purpose attached to the color of the lighting. But for now, we're just going to add some emissive ceiling lighting at the upper corners of the street segments. I'll add some support geometry around the emissive meshes to make it look more attached to the frame of the corridor as well. Now I'd say we've got a pretty decent variety of shapes for our first iteration layers of detail. But if we take a look at the demonstration scene, you'll see that we're a lot closer to it, but you'll also notice that it still looks very different in terms of color and lighting. What I'm actually doing in this demonstration scene is making use of a few extra tools. Firstly, Aura Volumetric Lighting, which is available on the Asset Store for free. If you want to try Aura out for yourself, I'll leave a link in the description. But just be warned that in the current version, it takes quite a while to import into your project. So if your Unity seizes up, just give it about half an hour or so. Secondly, I'm making use of Unity's post-processing stack, which is also available for free. But on top of this, I am using some tools from Amplify Creations, namely Amplify Occlusion and Amplify Color, with a lookup table texture from their associated LUT pack. This isn't essential, of course, but as part of the continual visualization process to help get a feel for what I want to add to the environment next, I like to give it a faint mood. If I don't have a specific purpose in mind for this environment, then I will change the visual mood to suit how I am feeling. The reason the demonstration scene is using a greenish tone is because I was actually in the mood to play some Fallout when I set it up the first time round. Now since we're getting quite close to the demonstration scene, I'm going to make a jump forward now and just swap directly over to it, where we can start talking about tile-based modular level design as a whole. You will notice that there are a few extra detail pieces that I added to fill in some space, nothing too complex. So now that we've got some content to work with, we can look at effective ways to create scenes with it. A good idea is to create new prefabs with segments from the corridor that are already decorated to a certain degree, and then use these to construct the scene. If we already include a baseline level of detail in our construction prefabs, then we won't have to keep adding all of the pieces every time we want to add a new segment. If we create a few different varieties of the same prefab with alternate variations of the details, or smaller details in a different layout, then by mixing these together we can very quickly build a corridor layout which breaks the repetition. Creating prefab variations is also where we can start talking about kit bashing again. If we create multiple variations of finer details, such as paneling and greebles, we can mix and match them to create new variations of corridor segments as new prefabs. Strictly speaking, we recycle a template prefab and keep creating new content from it. Something important that we need to talk about is the issue of forgotten space. There's a rule you should remember when placing modular objects that might sound counterintuitive at first, but it's all for a good reason. The rule is, when you fill empty space, you create empty space. What I mean by this is that if you disrupt the consistency of the grid, then you will create inconsistencies in other places in the same grid. For example, if I wanted to add a doorway to the end of a straight segment that is not as long as the primary tile unit for our modular set, then what you will see is that as I add more pieces and curve around to connect back onto another part of the same grid, we bump into an issue of empty space. Now I use the term primary tile unit, but what do I mean by that? In a nutshell, it's the smallest possible unit of size for a segment that we consider to be a basic building block of our tile set. You will notice that our straight segments and junctions are one by one by one in proportion. So as long as we keep all of our pieces consistent with this proportion along our invisible three-dimensional grid, then we won't create any unwanted empty space. The thing is, sometimes we need to break the rules for artistic reasons. If we know that an area we are creating is not going to loop back around to the original grid space of our starting zone, then it doesn't matter. However, if we do want to reconnect an inconsistent area back onto the same grid space, then we would need to be clever about using objects for transitioning.
With that being said, I think we'll wrap it up for this video. In the next one, we'll explore ways to push this scene further. So thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.